I'm Sherry Reichard Ballou. I am a certified high performance coach and author of Say It Now. And I am so happy to be here with my friend Jeff Griffin. Hi, Jeff. How are we doing, Sherry? Good. Hey, we made a little agreement that you were going to do your little introduction because I loved what you said. <laughs> Absolutely. Sherry was asking me, like, how do you want me to introduce you? I'm like, are you a motivational speaker? I'm like, Sherry, I am the best unknown speaker you have never heard of yet. <laughs> and, uh, and and I also told her too, I'm like, uh, a lot of people are like, hey, so Griff, are you a motivational speaker? And I'm like, you know what? Honestly, people might call me a motivational speaker, but I like to think of myself as a transformational speaker. I like to believe that I have a transformational message, life altering experience. I love it, Jeff. I love it. And, you know, I just, we had a little mutual admiration going on before this, which I just want to say again, every time I've seen you, you have just, you light up the room. You really do. You know, you're present. I, I can see how present you are with everybody and the kindness that you bring and the curiosity. Can you tell us, like, let's just start with a tiny bit of, of your story. I know we could go on for hours. But let's, let's hear some of your story. Absolutely. Thanks, Sherry. And what's interesting is um, what your audience and, and uh, people can't see right now is that I'm in, in, I'm in a wheelchair. I wasn't always in a wheelchair. And I'm going to share a little bit about that as well. And so when I come out on stage, I roll out on stage. And I like to just to address the elephant, just to make sure that everyone feels yeah. comfortable. I get out there. I address the elephant. I'm like, hey, let's just address the elephant about how good looking I am. <laughs> <laughs> And I am completely joking at that because I, I'm just like, a, I'm just an under ordinary guy. I'm not an extraordinary guy. I'm an under ordinary guy that hopes to make an impact on somebody's life. And so, um, so yes, I am in a wheelchair and, um, and so absolutely. And so people are like, it's, it, it's not just the wheels, I guess that people see, but, I always like to say that we all look the same in the wheelchair, right? Everyone in the wheelchair looks the same. But um, what I've learned is I wasn't always, I wasn't always a happy guy. I wasn't a person that liked wow. to smile. I wasn't a guy who liked to go out and be in front of people. I, I wasn't a, a, the guy who, who would go and put himself in an uncomfortable situation. And so when I tell people that I was a very shy individual, they can't imagine it. They can't believe it. Like, no, not you. In fact, I would walk down the, the halls of my high school like this. If you're walking towards me and, and, and I really liked you or I felt something, you know, and that was just about everybody. I was, I, I'd, I'd go like this and walk past you. Jeff. Yeah. I know. It's so interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And so, in fact, people thought that I was very, very stuck up because I was the star football player on, on our high school football team. And so they associated this 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 receiver who was amazing at a sport that would walk down the halls and turn his head and look down as he walked past people. And I always joked that whenever I went back to my five-year, 10-year, 25-year reunion, I'd go up to people because there was a transformation that took place. There was something that that, that uh, clicked for me. And I flipped the switch and I, and I made a conscious decision to be a better person, to be, I shouldn't even say a better person, but a more outgoing person, a more energetic person, a more magnetic person, yeah. you know, as, as you were describing there. And so I always joked that I'd go to my reunion and I pulled out my hand. I'm like, hi, I'm Jeff. I'm like, who? I'm like, like, oh yeah, you, I, I know who you are. <laughs> okay, Jeff, you know what I'm going to ask? When and how did you flip that switch? Because this is a time when, you know, it is obviously like, a lot of people are going through a lot of hard things and a lot of us are just wanting to just be like this, right? Put our heads down and, and like the ostrich, like just, just pretend this isn't happening. It's not happening. It's not right. happening. So uh, how'd you do it? What, what was it? What was that moment of flipping the switch for you? So there was a question that changed my life. Ooh. Hope you tell us. You know, it, it literally changed my life. And I'm going to share that question with you and your, and your audience here. But before, I'd like to just kind of rewind just a little bit. If yeah, I can. absolutely. Just kind, of, just kind of share with 
um, people where we are right now. Because a lot of people think, oh man, you're so positive, you're so happy, you're so, all this. And again, they don't realize that I wasn't always that way. In fact, the first time I gave a speech when I was eight years old, it was, <laughs> it was in church. I stood up, my mom made me memorize it, and, uh, and we kept on doing it until I didn't, until I didn't, until I got it right. And, and I've learned that you've got to keep doing it until you don't get it wrong. Um, but I just went until I got it right. And when I got up there, I froze. I, I, I was paralyzed. And my mom's sitting in the front trying to mouth. <laughs> oh. And I can't, and I can't even uh, read. I don't even know what she's saying. I'm just like, this was the longest 30 seconds of my life. And so, it, so um, um, I want people to know and understand that we can change. If we want to, we can change. And uh, change isn't always bad. And I've learned that um, different isn't always better, but better is always different. And so if we want to make things better, we're going to have to think different. Yeah. And, and I hope to, to push people's thinking here a little bit. And, and so long story short here, I want to be a football player. I, I told people I wanted to be a football player, and they gave me all the reasons why I can't. Like, Griff, you can't play football. You're too short. You're too slow. You're too white. I'm like, okay. All the reasons that are valid. But at the same time, I can improve on all of them but one. And um, <laughs> I'll let you guys guess which one that one is, right? Some people are like, yeah, you're still slow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I'm like, so this word I can't, if there's anything that I can share in the small amount of time that we have with each other is to eliminate that word from our vocabulary. Yeah. I can't is debilitating, it's poisonous, it's limiting. And as soon as we say that we can't, our brain accepts it, our mind accepts it, and, and we don't find any solutions on, on how to figure it out. And so I didn't realize that as a little kid, but I continued to just follow my desire, follow, follow my heart, and listen to the song that sings in my soul. Mm. And I play football. And, and um, after my senior year, I came home and there was a letter from the legendary Hall of Fame coach, Lyle Edwards, inviting me, the short fellow white guy, to come play for his school. And I got to experience what it would be like to play college football. I tasted the sweetness of success and played two downs. And, oh, sorry. oh, there you go. You froze on me for a second, but here you are back. Are we Are we good? Because Yeah, we're good. I didn't want to lose that, though. I just want to pause. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you tasted it. Yes. So I tasted it, tasted the sweetness of success and went home during the summertime because they don't pay enough money to play football in college. And I'm like, well, what can I do to earn enough money so I can focus on college and focus on football? So I decided to start my own business as a painter, not pictures, but buildings. And, I, and I'm from northern Utah. And I got a phone call from Napoleon Dynamite country up there in Preston, Idaho, inviting me to come up there and do a bit on her barn. Got the job three days later and three thousand dollars richer. I'd have enough money to go back to school, and um, and focus on my dream. I get there. I have two levels of scaffolding. I have a thirty foot ladder on top of that, lean up against the barn, and I start up the ladder. And halfway up the ladder, I yelled up down to my buddy. I'm like, Doug, we can relate this to life, step by step, precept upon precept. And he's like, Shut up, Griff, stop preaching to me. And I'm like, Okay, sorry, time out. <laughs> And I get to the top, I lift my arm, squish the lever, of the, and the paint just dribbles out. The pressure wasn't on, so I get down to the ground. <sighs> my buddy's able to breathe for the first time. I go adjust the sprayer. I get back up on the scaffolding, lift the ladder one notch higher, and I go back up the ladder. Yeah. And I was bound and determined not to come back down until I was finished with that job. So I get up there. Halfway up, my buddy yells up to me. He's like, Griff, I know how excited you are to go bungee jumping tonight, but you don't have a cord. And I'm like, shut up, Doug. Stop preaching to me. And then this time I get to the top and I'm like thinking to myself, what can go wrong? And I lift my arm above my head and that infamous feeling that we've all felt before in grade school where we're leaning on a chair. Oh. And we and the teacher tells us not to and we're like, what could go wrong? And your stomach pull up to your mouth and pull down to your legs and it tells that your stomach again. I felt that feeling and I dropped the sprayer and I'm like, oh, shoot. Yeah. Um, let's just say I said shoot. And uh, I, I don't know, maybe, I, I said that. maybe something else came out. But I, I dropped a sprayer and the scaffolding slipped out from underneath me and I'm falling. Oh. And, and that's why I, I, 
I, I wanted to um, take some time with you because I know and understand there's some people listening today that have had their ladder or their foundation yes. out from underneath them. Wow. It could have happened years ago. It could have just happened recently. But I, but I know that um, there's a lot of people who have built this foundation and they're building this world on a foundation that uh, we, may have, we may have cut corners on or whatnot. And it slipped out on us. And for me personally, I've learned for myself at that very, very moment that when we cut corners, it leads nowhere but down. And, and so I'm going down. I'm scrambling. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to claw my way back up to the top. And oh, it's not happy. And so I'm trying to problem solve in 1.2 seconds, I think it is, from from the top of the oh bar down, there's the ledge. I reach out to grab onto the ledge and, and, and I dig in my fingernails and I'm holding on, but because of the weight of my body and the pull of gravity, it popped my fingers off. The ledge, not my hands, please do not do that. <laughs> it, was, it was the ledge, not my fingers. Um, these are my original fingers, love them. Yeah. I love your humor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad somebody does. Um, and, and by the way, Sherry, whenever he's like, Jeff, you are so funny. I'm like, hey, looks aren't everything. Oh, Jeff. I yeah. know. Go on. Go on. I want to, I, we got we to gotta hear how – we got to hear this. We, we got to get to that question. You got to get to the question. Right? I, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like fishing. I'm fishing. I'm like, hey, who wants to hear the question that changed my life? And some people are thinking that this, this incident changed my life. And it did. My fingers popped off and I go down and last it's desperation. I'm just scrambling. And I don't remember doing that so much as knowing that I did when I had a chance to examine my wounds. I noticed there were paint chips and wood splinters jammed underneath my fingernails. Wow. Some of us are clawing right now. Wow. Some of us have been hanging on. Some wow. of us have been setting up our foundation improper. And wow. that's why I love what you're doing is to help make sure that that if you do fall, there's somebody to give a hand up, not a hand out. Mm -hmm. Or if you're if you haven't fallen yet, just to make sure that that foundation is is shored up and your footings are strong, and and of course, to to make sure that um, um, we're there to help people through those those trying times. Because when I fell, I'm like, okay, last last solution that came to my mind was stop, stop drop, and roll. So I looked down to the ground. To break my fall, I know it's a, I know it's a, a fire drill, but I'm going to stop. I'm going to drop. I'm going to roll. And so as soon as I look down to the ground, I hit. Oh! I struck. I stuck the landing perfect. My legs came up. My back came down. My elbow and vertebrae exploded inside me. And you could imagine as I crumbled to the ground, oh, it felt like an underground cavernous explosion had coursed down my body, down my legs, down my arms, down my fingertips and toes. And to alleviate the pain, I reached down to grab my legs, and my hands could feel my legs, but my legs could not feel my hands. Oh, Jeff. So you could imagine a young man, 21 years old. 21. Tasted the sweetness of success of what it would be like to be on that field, having everything fall with him, my identity, the, the labels that I was developing, just came crumbling down with those ladders and that scaffolding. And I fell 40 feet, stuck the landing, broke my back, changed my life instantly. And so there I am, I'm on the ground. And so the question that I discovered and the question that I always like to ask people, and by the way, this is not the question that changed my life, but it's a question that I want to present to everybody. And that is how do we deal with major challenges and difficult setbacks? What's our MO? How do we, do we curl up in a ball? Do we go hide? Do we put our head down? You know, or do we continue to do what we've always done, expecting different results? What do we do? And at that moment, I had a decision to make. I could stay down and wallow in that syrupy, sticky sauna of self-pity, as I call it. Yeah. Or we can get back up and dream new dreams. And so the question that changed my life was something that helped me exit that son of self-pity because I went in there. I went in there. I was shaking my fist at God. I'm like, why me? Why does this have to happen? And then, I, and then I started blaming myself. I'm like, you're an idiot, Griff, because you set up the scaffolding. You cut corners. You're doing this. Oh. You know, all this self-harm that's going on here. And 
I'm just having a difficult, difficult time because in my mind, I'm like, it's going to come back. It's going to come back. It's going to come back. The next day it doesn't come back. Three days later, I'm in surgery and, and they go in there and they, and they cut me from my belly button to my back. They put a four inch plate in there. They cut one of my ribs off. They clean up the shrapnel, sew me up and staple me shut eight hours later. And I can't feel a thing. My, from the waist down, it's completely gone. So the doctor gives me a life sentence from a wheelchair and says, Griff, you have a 0% chance of ever walking, standing, or moving your legs again. And I believe some of our listeners feel like they have been given a 0% chance of never X, Y, and Z, fill in the blank. You're not going to be able to get through this this uh, challenging time right now. You're not going to find love. You're not going to um, yeah. lose that weight. You're not going to achieve your dreams and desires. You're not going to, you know, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. I was given a 0% chance of never standing, walking, or moving my legs again. And so as the days went by after the surgery, and then taking me 30 minutes to get out of my chair, into the, you know, out of the bed, into my wheelchair, I'm like, all the evidence was stacked up against me. But here's the deal, Sherry. I had I had a little um I wouldn't call it music. It wasn't music. It's music right now. It's it's a whole orchestra right now, but there might have been just a small little tone or a small little tune inside my heart that said, You're gonna walk again. And I'm like, okay. But then again, all the other evidence was stacked up against me, and then I was still having this. I was still have this pity party, and then they stopped feeding me in the hospital, in my bed. They wouldn't feed me in my bed. I had to get out of my oh. bed and go to the cafeteria. Oh wow! And so I had to get up. It took me thirty minutes to get out of my bed. I got in my wheelchair and I was rolling down the sterile halls of the hospital. I'm having a pity party. I'm in this stop, this syrupy, sticky stop, so pity. And I'm inviting everybody to come join me. And I'm crying as I'm rolling down towards the cafeteria. I don't want to be around anybody. I want to be left alone. I get my food and I'm going down and I want to be as far away from people that probably can. So I pick the furthest place I can possibly go in the cafeteria, place my food down. I'm flavoring my food with my tears. And also in this tray plops down in front of me. I'm about to look up and tell this guy to go somewhere with some colorful language that I won't use right now. And I look at him and he looks at me and we have that experience that a lot of girls do where they glance at each other in two seconds and they have a 20 minute conversation. <laughs> yes. I have seen that before. I don't know what's been said, but I've seen it. I'm like, that you guys just said something. Well, I experienced it with this guy. He and I looked at each other. We had this conversation, this quick conversation. And then he broke the silence. He broke the stare with the question that changed my life. Oh. And this is the question. He looks at me. I look at him. And he's like, why are you crying, dude? I'm like, what? He's like, why are you crying, dude? And I realized what he was asking me in his slurred speech. This man was a prisoner at the Utah prison at the point of the mountain. He was lifting weights. And he had an aneurysm that paralyzed him from the right side of his body, and he couldn't speak. And in his third speech, he asked me the question that changed my life. And he asked me, why are you crying, dude? And that question snapped me out of my pity party. Why am I crying? And I looked around and I noticed that there was a guy who was paralyzed from the neck down. He had a halo on it, was screwed to his skull, and he couldn't even feed himself. And he, so he had to eat by having somebody else feed him. There was another guy who was paralyzed from the neck down as well. And he could barely move his arms, but he couldn't grab the fork. So they taped the fork to his hand. And he had he scooped it. By the time he got the fork to his face, most of the food was gone. And I'm looking around and I'm thinking to myself, why am I crying? Oh, Jeff. I can move my hands. I can hug people. I can give high fives. I can move myself with my arms from point A to point B. There's so many things that I can do. <sighs> that these individuals cannot do. And what's interesting, what's ironic is this young man was a prisoner at the point of the mountain that society has deemed incapable of providing something for society. But this prisoner set me oh. free 
for my Christmas. Oh. Oh. Wow. Yeah. So why are we crying? Jeff. Why are we crying? Oh my goodness. I'm crying. You can't see, but that did really, I mean, tears in my eyes for the beauty. I mean, so, this is so beautiful. Thank you. It's beautiful. All of, like it's a beautiful the whole journey that you've been on, but and it's beautiful that you're here with your smile and your energy. And I mean, you you can't see yourself, but the light is hitting your face, so you're kind of like haloed, <laughs> radiant right now. There you go. It's so beautiful. And I I don't know if you can see, but Nancy and Jeanette and Irene are here, is talking and saying hi. And I love I love Nancy said um, heart tune. She echoed that that you had said about that little tiny tune. Yeah. Um, wow. It wow. was just, it was just a note that's turned into an orchestra. And so from that point forward, Sherry, I've never gone back to that song of self pity. It's been 20 plus years since I've been in a chair. I've been in a chair longer than I have out of a chair. And my dream of walking again has grown and has expanded and it gets louder and louder. And in fact, I told the doctor, that I was going to walk again. In fact, my dream and desire was to walk out of the hospital. And I told the doctor, he's like, Griff, it's impossible. You can't do it. And he gave me all the reasons. And, and he showed me the scars and, he, and, it, and all the evidence was there. I couldn't feel my legs. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. But I had a different opinion. I had a different song that sang to my soul. And, and so I just kept on every day focusing on what I could do instead of what I couldn't do. And what I could do, Sherry, is I could go out to the front of the hospital, let the sun just shine on me. I could read my Calvin and Hobbes cartoon <laughs> book. And I could do my exercises in my mind. And I, in fact, I sat out there and envisioned myself doing leg extensions and, and, and uh, squats and leg curls. And I envisioned myself walking down the street. And I would do that. And I was doing it so much in my mind that I was physically sweating. And people wow. were looking at me like, this guy escaped from the mental ward. And uh, I've been called delusional several, several times. It's like, Griff, your dream is delusional. And I'm like, okay, but I have a dream and, and I'm chasing after it. And, um, and, it, and it just keeps me going. And, and I keep on focusing on what I can do instead of what I can't do. And I have lived an abundant life. I love where I've been. I love where I've gone and I love where I'm going and um and and I'm just so excited I may be physically paralyzed Sherry but I think most of us if not all of us are paralyzed from the demons of doubt fear and complacency oh yes 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 wow there's so many things going there through my mind first of all I just want to like offer some huge appreciation to that 21 year old kid right i mean you're still yeah. a kid at that age yeah. like when you tell that story don't you just like i'm just like wow he found like he found such a depth of um what a depth of like self-love a depth of you could tell me more but i'm just i'm just struck by what he found in himself to to move forward like that yeah and and here's what i've learned i am grateful to be in a wheelchair I am grateful to be in a wheelchair, dissatisfied, but grateful. And, and, um, and, and it's taken me everywhere. I wanted to play on the big stage on the college level. And my wheelchair has taken me to the world stage. I've been to the Paralympics. I played in the uh, Athens Paralympics. <laughs> that's, uh, that's my jersey behind me. Oh, is, and, that, uh, is that what it's from? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say more, say more. Where has it taken you? Where has that wheelchair taken you? Well, the wheelchair has taken me everywhere. And um, I've, I've developed a peer-to-peer -peer leadership um, workshop that um, I've been on a humanitarian committee for the last 10 years. We deliver wheelchairs, 300 wheelchairs per project. We did 49 projects. Um, that's what I just do on the side. But they wanted me to create a project, um, this program that would help the people that were coming out of the shadows of society. And so we gave him some tools, and our first one was in Kathmandu, Nepal. And so that was where we first started, and that's where I got the, the, you know, the inspiration from the, the title of my book and the picture of my book of Mount Everest. 
And um, so we went in there, we, we did it. It's a four day program. We've been to Nepal, we've been to Serbia, we've been to Mongolia, we've been to Sri Lanka, we've been to the DR twice. We've been, to, we're gonna go to Peru and the Philippines. And the United Nations has just recognized that program and um, just a few years ago. And so it's taken me everywhere. Ah, oh, Jeff. I'm just seeing, do you see, do you see Amy's, um, yeah. I love it. Go you, awesome you, go you, awesome you. Oh. Yeah, in fact, Amy would like this. I just picked up yoga. I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm gonna focus on what I can do and instead of not focus on what I can't do. I'm always, I'm always trying to push myself. And so I'm like, I wanna do yoga, I wanna try it. And so, so, so I'm going through the downward dog motions and then they tell you to come up and stand up. I'm like, okay. I'll go up as far as I can and then poof, I collapse on the ground. And then I'm like, all right, I'll just do whatever I can do. And I am loving it. I'm like in day eight of, of this 30 day uh, yoga program. And so Amy, thank you for I know. all you do. Oh, and Jeff, I know you. I mean, you know, I, I didn't really say this, but it's like we know each other from basically like events, right? Yeah. So where we both traveled to an event, the last one being Puerto Rico. Absolutely. Where I, you know, I always completely delight. I mean, we never really get a chance to talk very much, but I see you just speeding all over the like, you know, you're you're moving faster than anybody else at these events, right? <laughs> I'm like, get out of my way. <laughs> right? On the beach, off the beach, it doesn't matter, you know. And um I I want to come back. I want to come back because I I just I love this. And I could just talk to you all day long if we could. Let's come back to where we are in this moment in time. And, and so many people, like you've said so beautifully throughout this conversation, there are a lot of people who feel like they have fallen and can't get up. Yeah. And I know you've talked a lot about this from your own story. Can you give us some other, like, are there some practical day-to-day -to -day tools that, or mindset tools or any kinds of tools that you could offer people of how to, how to know that, yeah, yeah, it's gonna be okay, you can get out. I can do this, I can do this, right? Um, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'd love to give that to them. And so for me, I, I've, I've, as I fail 40 feet, and, and I broke my back and my dreams were shattered of playing you know, football in college, I discovered some flecks of gold um, that got me to that point, that helped me get to the point of being able to taste the sweetness of success, playing two downs. Uh, and so often, Sherry, what we do is we skip over all those flecks of gold that are in front of us, oh. looking for the big gold nuggets. Oh. But if we gather up enough flecks of gold and put it in our pouch, we're gonna eventually have a big old pouch full of flecks of gold that we can hold. <laughs> and if we want to, we can refine them, we can forge them into some gold nuggets. And and so take it as as it is, you know, flecks of gold or gold nuggets, it's still a value. And, and I discovered some things that have really, really helped me out. And, and, and I wrote a book called I'm Possible, Desire, Dream, Do. And I threw a lot of these flecks of gold in there that we've, we've since these last 20 years, have taken them, have we defined them, we've refined them, we've practiced them, we've mastered them. We've been able to help other people duplicate the process. In fact, I've taken these things to help me um, go beyond what the doctors ever thought was possible. I use them to uh, um, to defy the zero percent percentage of having kids. The doctors gave says zero percent chance of ever having kids because it's the first function to go, last function to come back. We have four, my wife and I, four beautiful. Oh, oh Jeff! Yes. And and here's what I also want to share with your group as well. And I don't know if you know this, Sherry, but I was told that I'd never walk again. One year went by, two years went by. Um, and I love what Vince Lombardi said. He said, man cannot dream himself into character. He must hammer and forge him for himself. And so we've got to take those steps. And, and what I've learned though, is most of us won't even take the steps because we reject what we don't understand. We base our possibilities on what we know. And so we just sit there and, and paralyzed, waiting for, for the answer to come. And all we really need to do is just take that first step. And that first step might be, it's possible. Where, where before we're like, no, it's not possible. It's not possible. It's possible. I can do this. It's possible. And and I and I just want to just demonstrate here what I typically do at my speeches is um, 
we go through that story of, of being paralyzed and being told I'd never walk again. Oh, Stan, I don't know how pretty this is on, on camera. <laughs> oh my gosh, are you you're just standing up? I, I, I'm no hands, mom, no hands. Um, <laughs> you just you're just standing up just like that. Stood up, we walk across the stage, and as I like to call it, water, water with swagger, walk with swagger, that's what we do. And, um, and so there's a mountain outside my window here. I'd love to show it with you, share it with you. But um, here's, the, here's, the, here's the one thing that I want everyone to understand, that if they'll eliminate that word, I can't, out of their vocabulary, that's step number one. Eliminate that word, I, yeah. that, that word, I can't. It's debilitating. We hear it 150,000 times, 150, times by we're 17 years old. Eliminate it. Even, even if you can't, don't even say, I can't yet. Just say, I'm going to find a way. I'm going to figure it out. So this is what I want. This is what my desire is. And then the second thing is, is we have to be super, super clear with the laws of the universe, if I can say that. So many people um, don't know what they want. That yeah. they, 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 they don't even get it. And so what we have to do is we have to be crystal clear on what we want. Yeah. And I believe that success is a three-part series. You got to know what you want. You got to finish what you start and you got to celebrate the process. And if, and if the process is just, Hey, I believe now celebrate. Absolutely. I once didn't believe now I do believe. And now I'm going to figure out a way to get those results because how many times Sherry, have you worked with somebody that knows what to do? but they don't do what they know. Yeah. And there's that gap. And some people don't even know what to do. And uh, we have some beautiful things that can help us figure out what it is that we want. I call it dream weaving. We have some other tools that help us finish what we start. You are, are, are one of those great people that helps people. You're, you're, that, you're that guide by their side. Instead of the stage on the stage, you're that guide <laughs> by their side. And, uh, and he's doing some amazing things. And so we know how to do it. It's just now we just need to invest in the proper path and understand that the journey of a lifetime begins with one step. And it's going to take longer than we think it is or, or maybe shorter than we think it is. We just need to understand those universal laws. And once we understand them, then we can have some, you know, at least perspective. I've got perspective. Okay. I was told I'd never walk or stand again. It's been 20 plus years. If it's another 20 years before I run, that's fine. 40 years is still better than never. Oh, I love this. Jeff, oh my goodness. I am so happy because I just ordered your book last night and I can't oh wait. My goodness. <laughs> but I want to say, I know, I know we have to go in a few minutes, but um, I also, I want to go back to what I also loved because I don't know. About, like how important that is because when you talked about picking up those flecks of gold I call them pinpricks of light because oh, I love, love them. whatever you know I when I was suicidal that was my story I saw a tiny little pinprick of light and held on to, to that and and I, I really wanted to underscore that that it's like especially right now like you just said like maybe what it is is maybe somebody's just heard you maybe they're you know they're, they're watching this replay and they have that little tiny pinprick of light or a little bit of gold that they feel around like, yeah, some, something's possible. Yeah. Just like you said, to, you know, pause and really celebrate that's movement, right? It's huge. That is huge, right? Huge. It is huge. Where, where once you saw no light and you see a flicker of lights, I don't know if, you, if you've ever been, as you mentioned, you know, I want to take my wife on, on my wife and family on this, it's, it's called the Hiawatha Trail up in the northern uh, United States. It's a 15-mile train track they put into a, a, a bike trail. And you, wow. go, and you go through tunnels that you have to have headlamps on. And if you turn off your headlamp, you can't see a thing. Wow. And, and, it's just, and, and, and the darkness just starts to weigh on you. And then, because I want to take my kids there and just kind of have that, you know, make that connection that there's some people who are going through life in that dark, in that tunnel of darkness. And then as soon as you see that flicker of light, you're like, okay, I'll keep on going. I'll keep on going. I'll keep on going. I'll keep on going. 
And, uh, and, and so if we can just focus on what we can do instead of focusing on what we can't do, I'm telling you right now, that has just, I've been able to just shirk those shackles of chains off my back and, and just like, you know what, I'm going to just continue to focus on what I can do. And what I can do is I can wake up in the morning and I can smile because a smile is a curved line that sets things straight. <laughs> and, that, and that's what we need. Sometimes it's all, it's all we need is just a smile. And I used to hate my smile. And I, I, used, to, I used to smile like, like, did not like it at all. Did not like it at all. And so, uh, um, but you know what? I, I love it now because it's, it's just part of me. It's just part of me and um, take it or leave it. This is just, this is who I am. I'll, I, take, I it. I'll awesome. take a smile every day. Awesome. I want to say hi to Michael who stopped by. Hi, Michael, if you're still here. It's good to see him. Michael and his wife are some great, great people. I know. Great yeah, great give her a hug for us. They Absolutely. are, right? Talk about like good hearted people. Yeah. Jeff, this is amazing. I really am. I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to do this, to be here, you know, to chat. And I um, I really want people to, to just take away, if anything, just that one piece that you said, right? Like focus on what you can do. And I would add that focus what you do have, right? Because I know there's been so much loss and we it's terrifying if we go to that place of, and, and I know all our hearts go out to people who, you know, are sick and who have died and people who know people who are in those positions and people have lost their jobs and that's all there. And we can have so much love and compassion, but I think we also just have to also focus on what we have. And like, for me, I'm blessed. Like I have this, right? Like I have people in front of me to, to talk to who, share their stories and their wisdom and um, inspire and motivate and transform. Yeah. yeah, I love it. In fact, you, you mentioned something there, um, Sherry, about uh, mortality or death. And, I, and I've noticed in the news, there's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of you know, fear about dying. And, and again, the reality is mortality. We're all going to die. I get that. We don't want to die too early. We don't want to die with the, the music still in our, in our soul. Um, so what we do need to focus on, instead of instead of worrying about when we're going to die, because we're all going to, to die, instead of worrying about whether we're going to die, how are we going to live? Hallelujah. How are we going to live? And I love Dr. Oz taught me, he's like, he's like, Griff, give your heart a reason to beat. And that's why I think it's so important to dream leave. I think that's why it's so important to understand what you want. But we as human beings... Most of us don't know what we want. The majority of us know what we don't want. So we focus on what we don't want. But if you you know that as well as I do, we get what we focus on. Yeah. I don't want to be lonely. I don't want to be poor. I don't want to be a monster. I don't want it to be whatever it is, right? But the problem is, is most of us don't know what we want, but the majority of us know what we don't want. And, you, you know, for example, you go out with your friends, like, hey, let's go to dinner. Absolutely. What do you want to eat? I don't care, wherever. I'm like, okay, well, let's get Mexican. No, nah, I don't want that. <laughs> And you're like, okay, well, what do you want? No, I don't care, whatever, whatever. I'm like, okay, well, what about Italian? Mm, no, I don't want that either. And I'm like, okay, so what do you want then? But most of us don't know what we want. The majority of us know what we don't want. And so there's the problem. We keep on focusing on what we don't want. But if we're going to get what we focus on. And so if you can just do this simple little task, 10 minutes will change your life. It's called dream weaving. I'm telling you right now, it's just things just open up. You start to see in color. You start to hear the music that uh, that sings to your soul, and you'll be able to orchestrate and conduct the song that uh, that sings to you. And that's what I, I want to do is I want to help people understand that first, you have the ability to achieve your dreams and desires. You have the ability to figure this all out, and and um, and more importantly, we have the steps to help you orchestrate and conduct that song that sings to your soul. Can people find out about dream weaving in your book or are you going to leave us a link down in the comments? We yes, I, I will put in the comments on uh, my website, griffinmotivation.com. It's like Griffin, like the mythical beast, half lion, half eagle. I like to think that I am mythical and a beast. My wife reminds me, she's like, you're neither. And I'm like, well, what? I thought once you thought I was a mythical beast. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, so I mentioned it in my book, but 
but there's a place for you to get that dream weaving um, at, at my website. And, and, I'll, and if you put the coupon code LOVE, we'll knock off 50%, whatever it is. And I'll put that in your in the comments of where you can go, where you can find it. Give you some other things that are that are free that will change your life. The P squared mindset. <laughs> blow your mind and it's uh, and it's so simple and and a lot of these things are simple just not easy and and so yeah. um, but but they're possible we can do that so we'll make sure yeah we'll make sure that you get those in the comments and i want to read you before we go in case you haven't seen it but i love what michael just wrote he said jeff in your wheelchair you stand taller than most you inspire us brother that's so great mike this is the g in the sign language you know how the athletes pound their chest and point? I'm like, Griffin. <laughs> Absolutely. Jeff, thank you. Thank you. This has been, I was so looking forward to it. And um, it was every bit as wonderful to be here with you as I had thought. Thanks yeah. for the time. Thank you. I appreciate it. My, my son taught me a valuable lesson when he was two years old. He's like, Dad, there's long hours and there's short hours. And I'm like, that is brilliant from a two-year-old. What is going on here? And I'm like, so I wanted to know what the difference between a long hour and a short hour was. So I, especially to a two-year-old, so I'm like, son, what's a long hour? And without hesitating, he's like, church. Oh. And, I, and I'm like, okay, all right, I, I got that. And then uh, I'm like, so what's a short hour? And he's like, Pokemon. And so, oh. for Jerry, this has been a short hour for me. <laughs> so thank you. I love your love. I love your spirit. I love your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I just appreciate you allowing me to sit on your shoulder because it's easy to look good on this on the giant. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're awesome. I love you, Jeff. Thank you. you. Ah, yeah. see you soon. Yes, absolutely.